Well, good evening, everybody. Did you enjoy the spring? It was not, nice, was it? We hadn't gotten as much rain right here as some of you have gotten. And I just tell you what, I'm glad that we preachers are better forecasters of what's going to happen than the weatherman. That's all I know. Because it's going to happen. We Right? As we read out the Bible, it's going to happen. But we're glad that you're here. hope that this is beneficial to you. As we study the subject of patience, so I ask you to be patient with me as we study this great subject. Jamie was four years old, and he was going with his parents on vacation. He went the road a little ways, and Jamie said, are we there yet? No, we're not there. In a few minutes, Jamie said, are we there yet? No, we're not there. This kept, this kept going for a while. Till finally the father had had enough. The little boy said, are we there yet? And the daddy said, we're 90 miles away from where we're going. Do not ask that question again. So they rode down the road. And in a few minutes, Jamie said, I have a question. And they said, well, okay, what is it? He said, will I still be four years old when we get there? Patience. We all need patience and understand that, as the old saying goes, patience is a virtue. It is one of those great blessings. And some folks have it in more abundance, if you will, than the rest of us have it. And Lord love you for those of you that do. We understand the importance of patience and why we need patience, and yet some folks, as we said, just don't have much of it. And some of us are constantly working on it, trying to get more and trying to be better. But as we do, we understand that we have to cut out the part of our life wherein we are impatient. You know, that's the feelings that go along with a lot of different things, as we'll discuss this evening. But we need to be individuals that learn to be more patient. After all, it's what the Lord expects of us. When you go back to the fruit of the Spirit, what do you find? Patience. It's interesting that as you study this, and I, I don't know that this had dawned on me until I started studying this again this week, how many times in what I would call verses that have lists of things to do, you find the idea of patience or steadfastness or endurance, which is all part of patience. But from a standpoint of just, you know, out and out verses that talk about patience, there's not a whole lot, and yet there is. But what do we mean and what do we need with regards to patience? Well, I want us to look at sort of getting a, a just a general feel for where we're going and an understanding of where we are. We understand that the idea of patience is the idea of steadfastness or endurance, as we've already said. It's the ability to just take things sometimes as they come and not being first to lash out, the first to answer, or the first to, to respond in a very negative way. Now, sometimes that patience runs thin, doesn't it? Sometimes that patience that we have with individuals or life, as we'll talk about here in just a few minutes, sometimes that patience runs thin because we've had enough. We've reached our limit. We've reached our boiling point. It's sort of like my mother used to say when I was growing up, Paul, yes, ma'am, you're getting on my nerves. Translation, go somewhere else. We have those times in our life in which we grow impatient. And yet we understand that patience is a virtue that God tells us to possess. He tells us that it is important for us to live a life that continues to be patient. As we understand that and we get that and we see that and we feel that, it's difficult. It's difficult because there are things and there are folks and there are events that just push our buttons. They just get next to us. And while we, we 
don't want them to. We don't want to be ugly. We, t in turn, in our impatience, we turn around and we say something. We do something. We act out. We often then have to turn around and do what? I'm sorry. We apologize. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what I said. Sorry for what I did. Sorry for the way I acted. I'm sorry. And while it's fine and good that we apologize, we need to learn maybe to slow our roll a little bit, as the young people say. We need to, to be individuals that, that slow down. And are, as James says, we're slow to anger. But we look at that and we say, well, okay, who do we need to be patient with? And what do we need to be patient with? When we figure that out, then we can figure out how to go about being more patient. Well, who do we be patient with? How about God? God is a very patient God. God is long-suffering to us. We're not willing that he perish, but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, right? We know that verse. We know it well. Have we ever thought about the, the patience of God and the ability for God to allow his plan to take time to work its way out. When you think about, and one of the things that I got to think about as I was thinking about that this week, while the Bible tells us to wait on the Lord, and Isaiah reminds us of this in Isaiah 46, the psalmist reminds us in Psalm 46 to be still and know that I am God. Be patient. But when we think about the patience of God and working out his plans, one of the ones that came to my mind is Abraham. The promise was to Abraham. The promise that through his seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And I wondered, and I got to looking and figuring and, and digging some more. How long was it, say, from the time of Abraham to the time of Jesus? It was about... 1,700 years, almost 1,800 years. It's a long time. And then if you go, the number of generations from the time of, of say, Adam to the time of Jesus. One of the things that I talked about this afternoon at NHC, I, I talked about why Jesus died on the cross. And the first point that I made was that it was to fulfill and ultimately to finish the plan that God had with regards to salvation. But when you think about the promise in the Garden of Eden that God, in talking to Satan, he shall, you shall bruise his head, but he shall bruise your heel, that was predictive, I think, of Jesus Christ, prophecy with regards to Jesus. And you think about all the number of years from Adam to Jesus, and you think about, well, it was a long time. Here's how Paul answered that in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. That in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. Fullness of time. What does that mean? It means at the right time. Just at the right time, God sent forth his son. God is a patient God. We could go back and we could look and we could figure out that, you know, it took three years during from the time Nehemiah had heard about the problems in Jerusalem to the time that God sent him. God's patient. God's patient with us. We could spend time talking about other individuals and the length of time in the Bible, but we get the drift, and you know those as well as I. But we have to learn to be patient with God. What does that mean? Well, sometimes... In our prayer life, we have to be patient, right? We have to be patient and wait on God to give us what we've asked for, to give us what we consider is important, what we consider to be vital, what we are asking for with regards to God. The story is told of a young woman whose mother was baptized one Sunday evening after church. And in the stairwell was a large stairwell, and the lady found another lady crying. 
And the lady that was crying was actually the daughter of the lady that had been baptized that evening. Why are you crying? She said, for five years, I prayed fervently that my mother would obey the gospel. She didn't obey it. And I thought, what in the world am I doing? At the 10th year of praying that my mother would obey the gospel, I began to doubt that she would be a child of God. But I kept praying. In the 15th year, I still was praying to God that she would become a New Testament child of God, a Christian, a born-again member of the body of Christ. And I looked at myself and I said, you fool, why do you keep praying? And in the 20th year, I just about quit. That would have been God answered my prayers today. Key to that is don't give up on God. Don't stop. Be patient with God. God has a plan. We don't understand that plan, and we're not privy to that plan, other than what we talked about a little bit. All God works all things together for good. We get that. We appreciate that. But we have to understand that God is one that is in control. And so just be patient with him and be patient with his plan. We also have to be patient with ourselves. That's important, isn't it? It's important that we learn to be patient, to be patient with us. Jesus, in talking about the end in Luke 21, said, in your, in your patience, possess your soul, verse 9. Now, I was reminded of individuals that you need to be patient. There are different things in our life that cause us to be impatient with ourselves. Sometimes it's the pursuit of perfection, wherein we want to be perfect. We want to do something just exactly perfect. Those of us that suffer from CDO and ODC, right? OCD, there you go. Those that suffer from that have big time problems. Yeah, I want this to be just right. And if it's not just right, I've got to figure it all out. We sometimes grow impatient, not with just our own abilities and what we do, but sometimes we grow impatient with our circumstances in life, where we are, what's going on with us. What, what, what's taking place? Are we sick? Are we sick? In our sickness, we grow impatient. Why? Because we understand good health. When we understand that for the most part, and this is not, I understand this is not true with everyone, but for the most part, we have far more days of good health than we do of bad. But it's the bad days that cause us to grow impatient. And it's not just the bad days. It's also the fact that sometimes we know that those bad days were only going to lead to worse days. But we need to learn to be patient with ourselves. Sometimes we have to be patient with ourselves with regards to, to being individuals that are good folks. Just downright good folks doing what we're supposed to do. Being the Christian that we're supposed to be. Living the life that, that God would have us to live. We need to learn to be patient. Now, when I say that, here comes here comes really the, I guess you could say problem, or little check off that we must be careful with, and that is the idea of compromise. When we talk about being patient with ourselves, sometimes we say, well, let's just compromise, and we can't compromise. This morning in Bible class, we talked about the fact that we, we stand for our faith, we listen to others, but we can't compromise the truth. We can't change the truth. The truth is the truth, 
and we're bound by it and bound to it. But at the same time, too, we learn then to be patient and not settle, to keep on, to keep on doing what we're doing, to be steadfast, unmovable, always bound in the work of the Lord. Paul said with regards to us and all individuals, 1 Corinthians 15. And so it's important that we are patient with ourselves. But we need to be patient with life. I wouldn't dare ask you this question from a standpoint of asking you to respond physically, but just as a question to get you to think about. Has life for you always been smooth sailing? Have the rivers of life that you've traveled down, have they been easy and smooth? No wind, no storms, no, no waves. If you can say, I've never had a problem in, your, in my life, thank the good Lord. But most of us will say somewhere down the road, life took a turn. It took a bend. It took a, a change that we weren't expecting or, or didn't think about or didn't plan on, didn't look forward to. And we grow thus impatient with the life that we're living because everything's not going the way we want it to go. You see, we're going to have trials and difficulties. Romans, the 12th chapter and the 12th verse, Paul says that we're to be given to hospitality or given to help to others, patient in tribulation, patient in problems, patient in the things that we're going through, patient in the difficulties of life. Remember, remember, though, what James said. We, we know these two verses well, but they so fit this idea. Of James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Why? How in the world? How in the world could I be joyful that I had trials, that I have difficulties, that I have problems? Knowing this, that the trying of your faith works. There's the key word. Works. Patience. In other words, Life is about growth, isn't it? Life is about moving forward. God really doesn't want us to be individuals that are constantly looking back and dwelling on the past. Now, we learn from the past. Deuteronomy chapter 6, we learn from the past. We learn from history. We learn from what's going on, but we don't dwell on it. We learn the lessons and we move forward in life. We understand that life really only has a front window with a mirror that can glance back, but truly no back window to which to dwell upon the past. And so we grow patient in our life, knowing that the problems that we're having are producing that which is good for us. But then, fourthly, patient with others. You knew I'd have to get there, right? You were, See, you were patient with me till I got there. You illustrated the point. But folks rub us the wrong way. You know, we all have a temperament. We all have that level that we talked about in the introduction. As we have that point, folks irritate us because they make us reach that point and go a little bit beyond. We understand that because we've all been there, done that, and tasted that, right? We have the hat. We have the T-shirt. We've been there and done that. Others push us. Why? Well, sometimes it's what they say. You know, we talked this morning about living a successful life out of First Peter two, uh, 3, excuse me, and we talked about one of the things that we do is that we think before we speak. And as we think before we speak, we understand 
that we're to be individuals that think about others first. The Bible talks about love in 1 Corinthians 13. And it is, isn't it interesting that how he begins is this way. Love suffers long. Love is patient. In Greek thinking, in the New Testament times, lists as we have them are not like the way we compound them. In other words, a lot of times if I were to ask you, hey, make a list of your favorite foods. Number one would probably be the food that you like the very most. Number two, fairly close. Number three, then eventually it kind of all runs together and you just make this list. And I say, you know, I say, I need a list of 10 things that are your favorite food. You make it. Like I say, number one, pretty strong. Number two, Greek way of thinking, New Testament times, it wasn't that anyone in their mind, any one idea outweighed the other. Now, preference was given, interestingly enough, to what was at the beginning of the list and what was at the end of the list. But really, everything with in their thinking, in their culture, everything in that list was as important as the next thing. But think about how he begins about love. Patient. It's patient. It's patient with people. You know, forbearing one another. Colossians 3, verse 13. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven us to be suffering long. Sometimes people don't just say things, but sometimes it's the way they say things. Sometimes people say things, and you know, one of the things we said this morning when we were talking about your speech, we said, think before you speak, and the I in think was for intelligent. Is it intelligent? Well, sometimes it's not, and sometimes it gets on us. And sometimes folks say things that we either think is wrong or is actually wrong, and it just flies all over us. But if love suffers long, sometimes we have to slow ourselves down and say, okay, I need to point you in the right direction. I need to show you the right way. I need you. But we need to think about how we do that. We're not quick to jump the gun. We're not quick to, to, to point out the error. We're not quick to be individuals that get mad. We're not quick to be individuals that get upset, that get flustered. We're patient. Why? Because we're going to do the same thing. We're going to say something that we think is right that's not going to be right. We're going to talk out of turn sometime. Shouldn't, but we're still going to do it. We're going to say things that, that are going to grate on folks' nerves. I mean, you know, my wife loves me. I know that. But every once in a while, I can tell when she rolls her eyes, I need to shut up. I've hit that limit. We still need to be individuals that those that we work with, those that we live with, those that we love, those that are our neighbors, that's, which is everybody. That we're individuals that are patient with them. Okay. Well, now that we've stepped on everybody's toes, everybody's toes, we need to ask ourselves, how do we go about developing this patience? How do we go about being a more patient person? Well, I really, what I really need to do now is just offer an invitation and walk out the door. Cause I, <laughs> but I'm going to give you some ideas that I hope you'll take into consideration and you'll work on. Because understand this, and, and years ago I, I preached not on patience. I've forgotten now really what it was, but I preached a sermon, and, and it was along, you know, lines of self-improvement and so forth. And, and this lady walked or called me the next day, and she said, well, it didn't work. Well, what didn't work? What you talked about last night or yesterday morning, whatever it was. And I said, well, what do you mean? Well, it didn't work. I'm not. Well, no, you're not going to wake up the next day and just boom. All of a sudden, you've changed. But this is something that you work on. So notice the key word, developing patience. 
first of all, slow down. Slow down. We're, we live and are very fast in our life. But he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, Solomon said in Proverbs 16 and verse 32. We need to slow down. Slow, as we said well ago in the introduction, as the young people say, slower roll. We are quick to judge, aren't we? We're quick to judge what people say and what they think. We're quick to judge how they act. We're quick to judge life. Sometimes we need to slow down. Slow down and, and breathe a little bit. Take a breath. Count to ten. Think before you speak. Develop patience requires us to slow down. Secondly, overlook frustrations. You're going to have a lot of frustrations in your life. Behold the day of small things, Zechariah said in chapter 4, verse 10. He's right. It's the small things in life that get next to us, isn't it? It's usually not the big things. The big things we're able to handle fairly fairly easily. It's the little things in life that really test our patience. It's the little problems, the little things that are said that sometimes, so many times, lead to our being annoyed. Stories told of a man that went into a local restaurant. This was more in a, a small community, not a big city, but a small community. Man went into the local restaurant and he was sitting there and he asked the, the lady that owned the, the restaurant, he said, You ever cook frog legs? And she said, Yeah, I've cooked everything. Yeah, frog legs. He said, Well, if. Someone brought enough frog legs in here. Would, could you sell them? Yeah. He said, well, he said, I can't sleep at night. He said, I like sleep with the windows open. But he says, out below my house, there's a pond. And there's must be thousands of frogs every night that just croak away. And I cannot sleep. And she looked at him and she said, okay. And he said, tell you what, I can go down there and I can kill as many as you want. And you can have a special maybe Friday night and you can cook everybody frog legs. And she said, we'll do it. So for a week, she advertised frog leg Friday night. Or, you know, came from far and wide. But before they got there. He had shown up that morning, Friday morning, and she said, well, where are they? Where are all of them? I need them. We're going to cook them tonight. And he held up one measly little old frog, and he said, this is all that was down there. You see, one sounded like thousands. And it's those little frustrations that nag us. It's those little frustrations that get under our skin. It's those little frustrations that, that truly irritate us. You didn't say something right. Life's not going well. God's too slow. Sometimes we just simply need to overlook those little frustrations. Behold, day of small things. Next, help me out. The reason I need you to help me out is because of the way I wanted it on this PowerPoint. What doesn't kill you, what doesn't kill you, does what? Makes you stronger. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> You're stronger than you think. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. You might say, preacher, I, I don't get that with patience. Well, I do. Why? Because the Bible tells us, Paul tells us that we shouldn't glory in tribulation, or that we should not only do so. But he tells us in Romans 5, verse 3, tribulation does what? Works patience. What doesn't kill you will ultimately make you make you better and stronger if you'll allow it. I don't think this is an absolute statement. I really don't. I think we've used it as an absolute statement, but I think it's a good statement. To understand that what doesn't kill you will make you stronger only if you allow it to make you stronger, only if you learn from it, only if you are an individual that is willing to grow from what you've learned. But 
If you know, tribulation, as Paul says, works patience. What doesn't kill you is make you stronger. So here's what you do. When you're going through those times in which your patience are tried, when you've slowed down and you're trying to overlook the little, little nagging things that are bothering you, see what you can learn from what's going on. What lesson you can ga gather and grasp and hold on to. See, see what's there for you that, that maybe God is trying to show you. He's trying to show you in his own way. Learn to move on, but learn while you're there. Fourthly, don't sweat the small stuff. Don't sweat the small stuff. A fellow by the name of Carlson wrote a book, smaller book, several years ago. Don't sweat the small stuff. It was so popular that he wrote a second book, Don't Sweat Small Stuff Part 2. Unfortunately, he didn't learn how not to sweat the small stuff, and he died of heart, massive heart attack in his early 40s. We need to learn that the small stuff doesn't need to be sweated. There was a runner once that was going to run, literally, of course, in a plan system, but run across the United States of America. He didn't make it out of California. Someone asked him, said, why in the world did you not make it out of California? He evidently wasn't a barefoot runner, Jerry, because here's, here was his problem. He said, sand kept getting in my shoe and causing blisters on my feet. And I had to quit. It's the small stuff in life that usually aggravates us. It's the small stuff in life that usually pushes us over the edge. It's the small stuff that really doesn't matter. So here's my point. Number two, overlook frustrations. Don't let the small stuff wet that stuff. Ask yourself one question. Is what I'm impatient over that important? Is it something that will go through eternity? Is it something that, that I really... You know, it just needs to be resolved. Don't sweat the small stuff. And then next, give everyone room. Give everyone room. The ark was eventually repaired, if you will. The Lord waited, as Peter said in 1 Peter 3, verse 20, the Lord waited in the days of Noah. We talked about the patience of God. Sometimes the plans of God and how long it takes to work them out. If God is that patient, and if he's that patient with us, that's something we didn't talk about. God is that patient with us. That when we make mistakes, think about how patient he is with us. Think about when we sin, how patient he is with us. God gives us space to repent, doesn't he? Go back and read Revelation 2 and 3. He gives us those opportunities. He gives us room to grow. He gives us room to, to not only make the mistakes, but he gives us room to correct those mistakes and correct those mistakes with people. If we're going to develop patience, one of the things we have to do is give folks room. Let them grow. Let them make mistakes. Suzanne has a, a, an aunt and an uncle and Probably tonight, one, if not both of them, are probably listening. So, <laughs> hello, John and Sue, if you're listening. I think it was Aunt Sue that told this story on Suzanne. That Suzanne's mother, of course, is probably all of you know, Suzanne's mother passed when Suzanne was two and a half years old. And Suzanne had a grandfather and a grandmother that in many ways raised her. And there was a, to be honest, we get down and tell the story of Suzanne. There's a lot of folks raised in Suzanne. I'm not giving up yet. I'm patient. <laughs> but Suzanne's grandfather was an interesting character, to say the least. He he uh, he he was he was interesting. I mean, I I appreciate the fact that I got to know him really well. 
he, he's the type of man that that uh, towards the end of his life he he had issues, memory issues, and things of that nature. And one Saturday, Suzanne had gone to get him and her grandmother, and we lived at that time about ten miles away from them. And I was mowing the yard, and he she came up and she said, "Grandma and Granddad are going to go out to eat." Okay, well let's go. Well. I can't. I'm, I got to finish mowing the yard. So Mac, that was his name. Mac looked at me and he said, well, go mow and finish mowing the yard. I said, I'm hot. I'm tired. I got to get some water. I got to rest for a minute. Then I'll finish. Well, where are we going? Mac? We're, we're going to the fish place. We're going to eat fish. Paul, go go out finish mowing the yard so we can eat fish. We'll wait just a few more minutes. Paul, go out. <laughs> and, and mow the yard so we can go eat fish. Yes, sir. Go out, finish mowing the yard, come back in. You ready to go? We got to go eat fish. No, I'm not ready. I got to take a shower. Well, hurry up. We got to go eat fish. Okay. So we get in the car. Um, I'll shorten this story. Anyway, we get in the car. We go another 10 miles down the road to the local place to eat fish. Waitress comes up and says, uh, you ready to give your order? And we all said, yeah. Paul looked at me, what do you want? Well, I want fish. I want two-piece dinner. What, I want the two-piece dinner. Looks at Suzanne's grandmother, Mildred. I want the two-piece dinner. Looks at Max and says, what do you want? He said, I want shrimp. I brought you all this way for fish. You hadn't had fish in a month, and you order shrimp. Yes, okay. Patience. Patience with him. But he was the type of fellow that... Uh, why I was started on Suzanne's family is because, if I'm not mistaken, Sue, and Sue told the story that Mac was the type of fellow, grandfather, that when Suzanne was learning to walk, he ran around behind her so that if she began to teeter a little bit, she wouldn't fall down. And he made sure that she didn't. And pretty much most of her life, that's what he did. You look at that, and you think, okay, how does that apply? Well, he was given a room to grow. We give our children room to grow. We give them the opportunity to learn to walk, and they're going to stumble. They're going to fall. Those little wobbly legs don't hold up. And we love on them, and we praise them for those first steps. And then they have many first steps of life, you know, changing from diapers to regular underwear. And, and we praise them for that and praise them for their school grades. And we praise them as they grow. And we give them room to grow. Now, why can't we do that with others? Why can't we be patient with them? Why can't we learn, simply put, to give them room to make mistakes, because we do. Patience, it's a virtue. I appreciate your patience tonight. You've listened so well. None of us are there yet. None of us are perfect in our patience. But may we ever grow to be better, to do better, to live better. This evening, we ask you to look at your life and where you stand. You might say, don't know when the Lord's coming back. That's right. We don't. We don't know when the patience of God will come to an end from that standpoint. And so we better be ready. Are you ready? If you need to answer his invitation, won't you come? All together we stand and sing.